Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. I was going to talk to you tonight about a pre-Adamic civilization because it was brought to my attention uh, this week when 23andMe, are you familiar with 23andMe? Uh, where they do the DNA testing. And they said that I was in the top 2% of all my ancestors were Neanderthal. <laughs> and so I thought, well, this maybe the Lord's trying to tell me something. But as much as I tried to put my notes together, I just couldn't do that. God gave me something else for tonight. And it's simply this. The scripture says, Jesus said this in John 15, 7. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. Now here's the key. I guarantee you as a Christian, there are things you have prayed for that you've desired that you haven't gotten. Now I'm not saying God doesn't answer your prayers. I'm just saying that it seems like sometimes prayers don't get answered. Or they don't get answered the way we think they should. It seems like maybe God didn't understand exactly what we meant when we asked him. So what do we do in these cases? What do we do when we pray for something? And it just doesn't seem to happen. A lady told me a few weeks ago, well, actually a few months ago, she said, my daughter, I love her, and I, I prayed always that she would find a, a fine, upstanding young man that loved the Lord. And she ended up marrying an, an idiot. He went to jail, and they got divorced. Why, <laughs> why didn't God answer my prayer? I was diligent. I prayed. I'm a tither, I go to church, I believe the word, but when I ask God to bring along a wonderful young man for my daughter, and she married that idiot, and then he went out and robbed a store and got put in jail, and then he found somebody else when he was in jail, and then he and my daughter got divorced. Why didn't God answer that prayer? Because Jesus said, ask whatever you desire, and it shall be done for you. Well, in Matthew 18, 19, Jesus said, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. So here he says it again. Find another Christian and agree with them. And if you agree with them, it'll happen. Well, this lady also told me, she said, I have a prayer partner. And we agreed together. And it didn't happen. Can I trust God? Is it possible that God just doesn't like me. You know, sometimes people quit the church. They, they quit following God because they'll ask for something and it doesn't happen. Or some dramatic disaster happens in their life. And they say, well, I don't know if this whole thing with God is true or not. And we all have perfect opportunities. We all have perfect opportunities. Don't tell me that you're any different than I am. And that this, we, we all, all have things that happen in life. And you think, how could this happen? Well, you know, there's things that the Bible talks about prayer. And tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about unanswered prayer. Why it's possible that maybe our prayers don't seem to get answered. You know, with everything in the Bible... There's qualifications. And a lot of people don't realize that there are qualifications. 
Now, it's not our works that saves us. It's not what we do that moves God necessarily. Because God's already done everything that God's going to do. Now, let me clarify that. Jesus came to the earth and he completed his mission. Right, James? He, he completed it. When he was on the cross, he didn't say, it's almost done. No, he said, it is finished. He did everything he was supposed to do, and he went to be with the Father. And Jesus and the Father are in heaven. But we know that God is a three-part being. He is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that part of God, is here on the earth right now. Where is he? If you're a born-again believer, he's living inside of you. He is in you. It's Christ in you, the Spirit of God. It's not Jesus the person in you. It's, it's Jesus his Spirit in you. You say, well, I thought it was the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, they're all the same thing, just different names for God's Spirit. Jesus and God are one. Okay, so we have the Spirit of God inside of us. So when Jesus says that he will do something for us, if we ask, how is that going to be done? Well, it's, it's going to be done by us requesting, and then by his Holy Spirit, he moves people and angelic beings move to accomplish what it is that we need done. Now, one of the things that I, I told this lady, and uh, to be quite honest, is we need to understand that you cannot enforce your free will on somebody else. You cannot control and manipulate other people. In other words, she wanted her daughter to choose a godly man. She was praying that a godly man would come along for her daughter. I believe a godly man probably did come along for her daughter. But her daughter had to desire it also. Her daughter had to want a godly man. But her daughter, and I'm not against motorcycles, don't get me wrong, but she wanted this biker guy, which is okay. We have great, great biker guys that go to this church. But this biker guy was a criminal and a thief. But she loved him, she thought. And she stepped outside of the will of God. And even though the mother was praying, the mother could not manipulate that girl into choosing the right guy. God could answer her prayer by bringing the right guy along. But see, control and manipulation is witchcraft. And we as Christians, we don't operate under witchcraft. We operate by the Spirit. And you've got to understand that where authority comes in, there are limits to your authority. Your authority cannot override somebody else's will. Why? Because God has given them the same free choice he has given you and me. Now, when we're praying, one of the things I think we need to do is we need to check why we are praying. Uh, you know, Smith Wigglesworth said one time, it's, it's better to pray three minutes with a purpose than pray all day with no purpose. It's not the length of your prayers that gets God all goose pimply and decide to do whatever it is he's going to do for you. No. It's not the length of your prayers. In fact, Jesus condemn some people because they like to pray so much they love to hear themselves pray. And have you ever been around somebody that loved to hear themselves pray? Well, I like to hear myself pray, but, but that shouldn't be the focus of my prayer. I love hearing you pray. But our focus should be, why are we praying? Now, sometimes people say, well, I just pray for fellowship with God. Well, that's good. That's good. There's nothing wrong with I have no need right now. I just want to I just want to worship the Lord. Father, I love you. You are amazing. Thank you for sending your son, Father. If 
Father, I, I speak the blessing upon my day today. You know, we can, we can fellowship with him, and that's good. But if you have a need, if you have something you need, be honest with God. Don't try to con God. Tell him what the need is and ask him to meet that need. That's what he wants. He wants us to be honest. See, Matthew 6, 8 tells us that God actually knows what you need before you even ask him. He knows. And somebody may say, well, if, if God already knows my need, then why doesn't he just do something about it? Well, God doesn't respond just to what he knows. And he doesn't, now listen to me, he doesn't respond to a need. Now, now think this through. If he, if he responded to needs, there would be no hungry people in the world. There would be no hurting people in the world. If he responded to needs, there would be no crisis at the border. He, he would have that taken care of. But he doesn't respond to need. He responds to faith. Now, when I say responds, I don't mean that God gets up and does something. What I mean is, is God has already put everything into motion. He has everything already set up so that when you pray with a purpose and you pray his will, then what he has already set up starts being activated. God's plan is already, it's already set. It's here. Now, remember I said he knows what we need before we ask? You say, well, if he knows what I need, why didn't he respond with meeting my need? Well, take a look at this scripture. James chapter 4, verse 2. It says, you lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. But now listen to this. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. Wow. Actually, if you go to the next verse, he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. That... <laughs> I had a young man tell me one time, so you're supposed to ask a mister? No. <laughs> because you, you ask with the wrong motive. In fact, some Bibles translate it that way. You ask with the wrong motive. You, you want something for your own pleasure, and that doesn't mean just something that you can enjoy because God does want you to enjoy things. But you're asking something for the wrong reason. You're trying to manipulate God. You can't manipulate God. You can't con God in your prayers. You don't need to educate God in your prayers. Lord, today at work, let me tell you what happened. When I was coming out of my office, well, he already knows all that. You don't have to give him the history and your side of the story. Oh, he, he knows your side, the other side, and the truth. You know, he, he knows everything. So just ask. But see, here's something else too. You shouldn't ask for anything that God doesn't want for you. First uh, John chapter 5, verse 14. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Isn't that good? Then verse 15 says, And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we have asked of him. So here's the whole thing. You can ask, and he, he will give you what you ask, but you have to ask something that's his will. You know, we, I've told you the story several times about a minister friend that I knew at another church. Actually, it was out in, well, I won't say where. Uh, another church, and it was a large church, and there was a uh, an usher at that church that was really, he was a good-looking guy. And at this particular church, 
It was a very formal church. And the ushers at this church, and I've been to this church a time or two, uh, the ushers at this church wore black jackets, black slacks, white shirts, uh, kind of a cool looking tie. They had white gloves. They wore white gloves at all the ushers. And, and I mean, <laughs> they were cool. They were good looking guys. And this girl that went to this church, after coming to this church for a few months, she saw this one guy, Usher, and she really thought he was pretty cool. And so she, she heard the minister preach that if there's whatever you desire, you know, that scripture we read earlier, whatever you desire, ask and it'll be yours. And then, you know, if God has promised you something, you know, and she read scriptures where, you know, God promised us a good life, you can have it. So she started saying, I claim him as my husband in the name of Jesus. And she'd start saying it under her breath. Well, after a few weeks, man, she was telling her friends, see that guy over there? That guy is going to be, he is mine. I claim him in the name of Jesus. He is mine. He is my husband now. And, and so, I mean, she just expected God to answer her prayer. And any day, he would just walk over and say, here, sweetheart, here's a ring, you know. <laughs> well, one day, she was really feeling bold. And she went up to him. And she said, I just want you to know something. I've been praying to God, and I've been watching you, and, and uh, you know, you're, you're always coming to church by yourself. I just want you to know I've claimed you in the name of Jesus, and you are going to be my husband. He said, well, I'm, I'm sorry to inform you, ma'am, but, but I'm married. And my wife has not been well the last year, and she's at home. And, I mean, it crushed this girl. And uh, the true story is she actually ended up quitting the church because she believed what the minister said. The minister said that Jesus said, ask anything that you desire, and you can have it. Well, you have to ask according to his will. Remember the scripture we had up there just a few moments ago, 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will. Now, what is his will? Well, his will is clearly defined in the word. You know, some people say, well, you just never know what God's going to do. Well, you haven't read the Bible. The Bible clearly tells us what God does. Is it his will for you to be well? For you to be healed is it his will for you to have prosperity is it his will that you not have a broken heart it is his will so if it's his will then it's okay to ask for it now some people when they pray they say uh, they, they they will say this I I just really don't want to ask God for anything. Prayer isn't just asking God for stuff. Well, the word prayer by its very definition means to ask. I don't know if you've ever seen any of these old, old English plays or uh, movies where somebody comes into the king, they come into the king's chamber, and they say, I pray thee, O king. Well, they don't mean they're praying to him. That means I'm asking you, O king, I pray thee, O king, grant my request. See? So God expects us to ask him. Jesus wouldn't have told us to ask him for things if he didn't want us to. But, see, sometimes you've got to pray the word in context. Jesus said in John 15, 7, once again, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Praying out of context is kind of like uh, the three stooges. Uh, I mean, now the three stooges are who? They're Larry, Curly, and Mo. I'm Larry. Okay, so uh, I saw this one three stooges episode where, you know, they were always doing this. How many of you even know who the three stooges are? Okay, <laughs> very few. <laughs> Wow, this is good. Great. <laughs> but see, and so, you know, Curly starts to do this, and then Mo does this. You know, and he, and he can't get to him. Are you following me? Why is that? 
Well, see, it, it's kind of like this is the word of God and this is the devil. And if you got the word in context in the right place, the devil can't get to you. You can still have the word but have it out of context. Are you following me? Or here, you know, you can, you can twist the word and the devil can still get to you. I kind of wish I hadn't used that illustration, you know. But, uh, but the reality is, is you can't twist the word of God. You can't try to make it say things it doesn't say. And sometimes people do that. When you're praying, you, you got to know that you know that you know that what you're asking for is God's will for you. All right. You know, we, I, I notice sometimes that I caught myself doing this several times. I pray selfishly. You know, I, I start praying for stuff for me that are not really important when there's important needs around me, you know, that need to be prayed for. But here's something else too. You can't say, well, I can't pray for this because God needs those resources over here. God's resources are unlimited. Now, Loretta, uh, my wife, for those of you who don't know me real well and watching on the internet, Loretta is my wife. We've been married for quite a few years. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, insert a number after I find out what it is after a while on that video. But Loretta has always said this. She says, well, you know, we, we need new tile in this room, but we also need to get the walls painted in here. Which should we do? Should we get the walls painted or should we get the tile? And I've always tried to tell her, and I, I think she's coming around on this, is it's not either or in life. You know, it is, it's possible to have the resources to do both. And we get into this with our prayers sometimes. It's either or. Well, you know, I don't want to bother God. You know, he's got a lot of stuff going on, and, and all this is is just a breathing problem that I'm having, and, and I can get by. No need to bother him. He's got more important things. No, God's resources are unlimited. He can take care of your breathing problem and heal all of the sick people on the face of the earth and it still hasn't touched just a little bit of his resources because his resources are unlimited. And when you pray, you need to understand this. I'm the pastor. Yes, God loves me. But he doesn't love me any more than he loves you. And Jesus didn't die for me any more than he died for you. You, you are valuable. You know, don't just, don't ever come to God in prayer and just say, well, I'm worthless and I know that in your kingdom, I'm really nothing. But no, you are just as much in God's kingdom valuable as anybody else in the church. Huh? Joint heirs. Yeah, we are joint heirs. Joint heirs. Yeah. Wow. And once again, joint heir is not the condition of a room in Colorado. Okay, when we pray, one thing that we should remember is we need to pray with thanksgiving. You know, Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So when you pray, you've got to believe that God's going to answer your prayer. And you're thankful that the prayer has been answered even before you pray. Get the words out. You know, we, we don't approach God with, oh, man. No, we approach him with thankfulness. God, I thank you that you are the Lord God and that you have more than enough resources to take care of this need that I have. And so, Father, I, I humbly, I, here's what I request. And then you request something. God loves it. God loves to give to his children. I mean, one of the greatest joys that Loretta and I have had in our lives is buying gifts for our kids at Christmas, buying gifts for our grandkids. 
I really don't care what I get. Well, yeah, sometimes maybe. But no, I, it's, it's, not, it's not what you get that brings joy. It's what you give that brings joy. You know, and, and so we need to understand that we are created in the likeness and image of God. So if, if joy brings us, if, if giving brings us joy, how much more does giving bring joy to God? Wow. This is good stuff. You know, be anxious for nothing. Don't, don't go to God in a panic. Now, I understand sometimes things are, are tough, and, and it's difficult, you know, if, if you're halfway over the cliff in your car, you know, that you don't say, Dear Lord, I come to you with great thanksgiving in my heart. You know, I mean, they're, they're <laughs> when, when you're going over the cliff in your car, it's like, Help me, Jesus, you know. Well, <laughs> and, and God, he gets it. God's not going to be critical because you didn't quote the 23rd Psalm before you ask, you know, for your, your, your thing, whatever it is. And, you know, what's in your heart is what's going to come out of your mouth. Jesus said that. He said, you know, he, he, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's why sometimes when you need to pray, in a panic situation, you know, you're going over the cliff. What you want to come out of your mouth is, help me, Jesus. You don't want to have, oh, blank, blank, <laughs> come out of your mouth, you know, because that doesn't really help a whole lot. <laughs> you know, it's almost like Jesus saying, I wonder why he said that. <laughs> Crash. You got to check your words. You got to be in control of your mouth. You can't be double minded. I was reading in the Bible today where one of the angels had two faces. I thought to myself, I know people like that. <laughs> you know, you, you can't be cursing and then all of a sudden say, okay, I'm going to talk to God now. It's like, okay, okay. Hello, God. How are you doing today? You know, you, you, you can't do that. God knows who you are. You can't be cursing one minute and then all of a sudden expect to step into the Holy of Holies and just have a conversation with God. You can, but I don't know if it's all that much more profitable. You know, read in the Bible. Now, now we're under the New Covenant. We're under the New Covenant. We're under grace. We have a lot of grace. But the Old Covenant shows kind of what God likes and what he doesn't like. And in the Old Covenant, God didn't like it too much if you were a thief and a liar and then you stepped into the Holy of Holies. You usually became toast at that point. Well, what's that mean? That means God doesn't want you being a hypocrite. He, he doesn't want you being one way and then stepping into his presence and pretending to be another way. You know, you should be able to step into the presence of God to ask him for something and be just the way you were when you were down at Walmart. Almost. You don't have a cart. But if you're needing something from God, maybe you do. Maybe you do have a cart. You kind of go in with a shopping cart. You say, God... This is what I need. And don't just say, well, I'm just going to ask him for one thing because that's all I think he can handle. No, you may go in and you have a need for this child and you have a need, you know, in, in your marriage and, and you've got a need at the office and, and, and you, can, you can just roll these things out. And if they're all God's will, praise God. He'll take care of all of it. Fill up your shopping cart. Okay. Now, that kind of falls into the category, and I'm not going to keep you a long time tonight, but it falls into the category of you got to check your faith level sometimes. Like, do I really believe that God's going to answer this prayer? See, we can't approach him wondering if he's going to do what he said he's going to do. God tells us what he's going to do, but we should approach him believing that he's going to do Actually, what he said he would do. 
It's kind of like saying, God, I don't know if you're going to keep your word or not, but just on the slim chance that you will, let me ask you something. Hello? How, how, how would that work with you? It's different words, but here's what it's saying. I know that sometimes you're a liar, but on the off chance that you're going to tell the truth today, you think that's a good way to approach God? I, I don't think so. You know, you better have your asbestos suit on. Well, God forgives us. Aren't you glad? Okay. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you want to know what God's promises are, you need to read what he said. And if you read what he said, enough, it'll kind of get inside of you. Next thing you know, you know that you know that you know what he's talking about. See, early on in my ministry, when I came out of Southwest Baptist University and I was pastor of the First Baptist Church in Fortuna, Missouri, I really didn't believe that God healed people all the time. I mean, I knew that sometimes people got healed. I knew it was, there were stories about it in the Bible, but that was just kind of like in the Bible. You know, this is the real world. I mean, let's get real. Supernatural healing today? But then the more I got into the Word, the more I began to realize, wait a minute. He promised healing for the church. And we're the church. What's, what's he talking about here? What you talking about, God? Come on. And then the more I read it, the more I began to realize, wait a minute. What I'm preaching at church is not what God's saying in the book. I need to start saying what he says. You start saying what he says, and he says in his word things like, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders. Let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, healed. Like, and it didn't say sometimes. And so the more I got into the word, the more I wanted to just take all my sermon notes and throw them away, which I eventually did. Because I wasn't preaching the truth. But it's so refreshing to know the truth. But how are you going to know the truth? Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is why we need to continually saturate ourselves with the word. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge of what? A lack of knowledge of the Word of God. It's not a lack of knowledge of what's being broadcast on Fox News or CNN or a lack of knowledge of what you learned in school. No, it's a lack of knowledge of what God says. Hmm. So, something else too. And without getting into all the scriptures, which there are quite a few, you got to honestly ask yourself, am I walking in pride or resentment toward somebody? You know, Mark eleven twenty four 24 to 26, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. See, a lot of people just stop there. But the next verse says, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may for also forgive your trespasses. And look at verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's pretty serious, wouldn't you say? This is Jesus talking. And he's saying, when you pray... If you don't forgive the person who did you wrong, then what makes you think that God's going to forgive you for what you did wrong? 
Now, just logically speaking, how is it do you think if you're standing before God asking him for something and you are in an unforgiven state? I think it's be a whole lot better if you're praying and you're asking God to, to do something in your life that you be in a place where you're forgiven. And the only way that's going to happen is if you forgive somebody else. So Sharon, I forgive you. James, I forgive you. Yeah. Rich, okay, I forgive you. Phil, I forgive you. See, look, and it's, it's more than just words, but you know, when you start saying that, something happens inside. And you can actually get to a place where you have forgiven everybody. In other words, nobody is going to offend you. You know, a scripture we read a few weeks ago, I think it was um, Psalm 119, 165. Boy, that's a long psalm. Uh, psalm 119, 165 in the King James Version says, Great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall any, by any means offend them. You know, and the only way you can get to a place where nothing offends you is you've got to be able to forgive everybody. Because people, myself included, we are all subject to doing something offensive without even realizing it. You know, you don't, you don't even know that you did it. I, I had a lady cuss me out. I mean, she just lit into me because I ran over her foot with my shopping cart. I won't say what store. But she said words that I hadn't heard for a while. And I, I didn't do anything on purpose. It wasn't like I, I got out of my car and I thought, man, I'm going to see that lady over there. I'm going to get I'm going to get on her aisle. I want to load this thing up with bottled water. I'm going to get this cart so heavy. I'm going to run over her foot. That's what I'm going to do. I've got it all planned. No, it wasn't planned. It's just something that happened. But to her, and the rest of the story is, I saw her in the parking lot. And I waved. And so did she. Um, <laughs> she just couldn't let it go. And she had to know I didn't do it on purpose. She had to know that. But I really offended her. But I decided I didn't care how she waved at me. I, I was just going to let it go. <laughs> and honestly, when I pulled up to the next intersection and stopped at the stoplight, I was laughing. Because, you know, it, you can't make me offended. You can hurt my feelings. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words are not going to offend me. That's not the way it goes. But Now, we've got to make sure that we don't give up on God. You know, it's possible to get so discouraged that you quit looking for what the problem is and you just give up on God. Just give up. I've asked him for this. I've believed for this. It's never happened. It's not going to happen. So let's just forget it. You know, the, uh, the greatest breakthrough, and I had somebody remind me of this today, the greatest breakthrough is just after the most pressure. Two illustrations. One, we could put a cellophane wall here, and I could push on it, and it'd be pretty easy. We're talking one of those plastic film walls. I could push on it, would it be easy? I could push a little further, and it would be, get harder to push. 
And the further I would push, the harder it would get. And it would reach a point to where I almost couldn't push anymore. But here's the thing. The hardest, the most resistance I will get is just before the breakthrough. And so we need to remember that. Who was the guy, Jaeger, that broke the sound barrier? And uh, there were a lot of pilots who tried to fly faster than the speed of sound. A lot of test pilots, and they didn't do it. And there were stories going around. You know, there were, there were even scientists who said, if you fly a plane as fast as the speed of sound, the plane will disintegrate and it'll, it'll evaporate and disappear. You know what I mean? It was one of those kinds of things. Because nobody had ever done it before, they didn't know. What happens if you go faster than sound? Yeah, you just emulsify. You just you, you, you disintegrate. Well, what would happen with some of these test pilots, they're in their plane and they're starting to approach they're starting to approach the, the speed of sound. And their planes start doing this. And so what happens? They're, they're afraid their plane's going to fly apart, so they backed off. Well, Jaeger, he wrote in his book, he's the guy that broke the sound barrier, he said he was pressing through, and, and, every, and it was like his plane was just going to blow up. But then when he broke the sound barrier, it was like, boom. It's dead silence, calm. See, and, and we need to remember that. Keep pressing in. Don't, don't let my sermon discourage you in your prayer. Don't say, well, I didn't meet step number four or that one thing he said. or what. No, 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 don't do that. Just, just say, okay, I'm going to approach the Father with a pure heart. And as far as I can see in his word, this is his will. And I'm just going to keep approaching. And the devil may be fighting me on this. Now, keep in mind, you do have an adversary. You have an enemy. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Who does he come to steal, kill, and destroy? You. You. You're a threat to his kingdom. The devil knows that one spirit-filled believer standing in their authority, believing the word of God, operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, can deal a severe blow to his kingdom. And so what's he want to do? He wants to deal a severe blow to you. And he'll do everything he can to keep your prayers from, from getting answered. But I'll tell you what, you just press in and when things start feeling like they're falling apart, that means you're getting close to your breakthrough. And you just keep pressing in with God, pressing in with God, pressing in with God, and believe in the Word. I am not going to give up. I am not going to let go. I am not going to quit believing what God promised me. Bingo! There you are. Breaking through to the other side. And that's where we need to be. I, I know there are some people who have prayed for years. There is never a prayer. Scripture will tell you there's never a prayer that goes unheard before the kingdom of God, before God in heaven. A gentleman told me one time he was in his, let's see, how old was he? I don't remember, but he was probably in his late 50s or early 60s, somewhere thereabouts. He said, my mother prayed all of her life that I would become a Christian that I would love the Lord. And he said, and he had just become a Christian. He had just turned his life around. And he was, he was strong with the Lord. He was, he was a strong Christian. He said, she prayed all those years. And he said, she died about 10, 12 years ago. He said, I guess her prayer just never got answered. I said, no, 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 no. You're living proof. Her prayer got answered. She's watching the result from the other side. But her prayer got answered. What she prayed for is answered right now in you. And, and it's true. Sometimes, sometimes we don't always see the answer to our prayer. But I'll promise you this, and I'll stand on it until the day I step over. 
what God has promised, he is faithful to deliver. And we've got to be faithful to receive what he's promised. Scripture says sometimes we don't receive because we don't ask. And you know what? A lot of people are being spiritually humble in their own minds by saying, I don't want to bother God with this. No, God wants you to bother him with his promise. He said, he said in his word, remind me of what I said. Tell me what I said. What did I tell you? You know, that's what parents do. I remember years ago, Robbie did something I didn't want him to do. And he was just a tot, little toddler. And he came in and I said, son, what did I tell you? <laughs> he said, well, finally he figured it out. What I told See, and God is saying, what did I tell you? Why are you struggling right now? Why are you having these problems? What did I tell you? And we need to go back to his word and find out what he promised us and then ask him for what he promised us. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in him. Let's put that scripture up on the, on the screen and we'll close with this. We're all going to quote it together. 1 John 5, 14. Where it says, now, let's all say this together. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now let's put up verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. That right there is the answer to the questions on prayer, all summed up in two little verses. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. And we thank you for providing a way that when we have a need, we can come to you and we can actually have that need met. We believe your word. We believe you. And we thank you, Father, that you love us so much that you've done this for us. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.